peace and sustainability is a collaborating uh, network towards the advancement of peaceful and sustainable societies and its global challenges. The theme of uh, today's webinar is system thinking and ecological approaches for uh, evaluating risk and resilience. And we are honored to have uh, Dr. Ali Karati from IASA with us today. So before introducing him, I just want to give you some uh, housekeeping reminders. This webinar is being recorded and later we will share it through uh, our website and also social media, including uh, YouTube. So if you have uh, any questions or comments, you can type them in in the chat box or also in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen anytime uh, during the webinar. Please just make sure to mention uh, your name and also uh, your affiliation. Uh, we expect that the talk will last for 30 to 40 minutes. And after that, we'll also have some time for uh, comments, questions, and also uh, ideas exchange. So I would like to now briefly introduce our uh, speaker. Dr. Harazi is a senior research scholar at the Systemic Risk and Resilience Research Group of the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA. And also he serves as a visiting associate professor at the uh, NERBS of the Hiroshima University. His overarching research interest concerns the sustainability challenges of coupled uh, economic environmental systems, and more specifically, the development of uh, models and metrics that can evaluate and uh, assess the resilience of critical global resource networks to shocks and disturbances. He has lectured uh, on human environmental systems, corporate sustainability, and also sustainable science at the University of Tokyo and Akita International uh, University in Japan. He holds numerous editorial board uh, positions in sustainability focused journals and also is the editor in chief of current research in environmental sustainability. He has received uh, prestigious competitive research funding, most notably from the Development Forum, Horizon Europe, and also the Marie Curie Fellowship. In addition, uh, he, his roles, in addition to his roles in academia, he engages the science policy interface previously as the consultant to UN agencies and food and resource uh, trade networks. And also currently he serves as the lead author uh, for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform and Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Khorazi, for taking your time. Uh, the floor is yours. You'll have uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's a great pleasure to be in uh, Hiroshima and amongst you um, researchers in the uh, NERPS uh, group. So I've made some slides for you on uh, systems thinking and ecological approaches. I didn't put too much math for you here, um, just to give you an overall idea of the uh, kind of research we do and hopefully inspire you to take on this uh, methods and explore it within your own research platforms. So let's talk about resilience. Resilience is often a concept you come across, but what does it mean? How do we quantify it? How do we model it? So if you pick up the dictionary, uh, resilience is a very standard definition. And this is a very, I should say, uh, engineering resilience, returning to the same original point. What it doesn't have, it lacks uh, adaptability in these definitions. We also have a lot of literature coming out of the, the psych psychological field talking about mental resilience. Today, we're gonna really look at uh, ecological network, uh, the fuel coming out of ecological networks, especially food webs. Uh, we're not gonna look at engineering resilience or social psychological resilience. So we're going to look at uh, some ideas coming out of systems ecology, specifically food webs, and try to relate it to uh, uh, social and environmental systems such as water, food, and energy, and also talk about uh, other metrics that come out of uh, ecological information-based networks called uh, point-wise mutual information, which is on risk and dependency. Let's go back here. A common misconception we have to the concept of resilience and this is a disclaimer for my own research, I guess, 
is that resilience is not always good. We keep on over abusing this terminology. Resilience of uh, this needs to be increased, or that needs to be increased. Well, in some cases, resilience is very bad. Resilience in poverty or dictatorship or eutrophic lakes, when lakes maintain too much algae. Uh, these are very uh, resilient systems, but are not wanted, right? We don't want that, they're not normative. Um, so that's a common misconception. And when I say resilience, really, we're talking about uh, normative and something we want in a system. Uh, but there are ways to look at a system, uh, undesirable system, and evaluate its resilience and disrupt its resilience, right? So you can use the same methods. So that's just a disclaimer. We also need to understand that uh, when we talk about resilience, we don't really expect a return to the equilibrium. We're not going back to the same situation as before. There might be elements of adaptability. You might be rerouting your system, or you might be redoing your system in a different way. But the point is, the outcome is very similar. So adaptability is also very key when we talk about uh, resilience. Last but not least, resilience is always, there's always a trade-off. Has anyone heard of Tinstafel? There is no such thing as free lunch. You, all, you come across this term in uh, business school sometimes, right? Tinstafel. So when I say increasing resilience, a lot of people say, let's increase resilience, but they don't really talk about the trade-offs. What does it cost? How much am I gonna spend for it? What am I gonna lose with additional resilience? So this is something I want you to keep in the back of your minds when we go through these slides. So we're gonna talk about ecological uh, information-based approaches. And the ideas which I'm gonna show you comes from Claude Shannon in 1948 uh, on information theory. But people studying uh, uh, food webs and ecological systems have taken these ideas and applied it in different systems, especially food webs and ecosystems um, and whatnot. What we did in, uh, in my research career, I've been applying these ideas and models to uh, social, economic, and environmental systems. So that's how the science moves forward, right? So you take one idea from a different field, you apply it in a different field, and you progress science in a way. So what we have to really talk about here when we look at uh, uh, the definition of resilience from this viewpoint uh, coming out of systems uh, ecology, pop up, uh, the most important definition is diversity and redundancy. So here you see, uh, does anyone know where this map is from, this metro map? Tokyo, right? So why is diversity or redundancy in a way so important in a metro system? I want to go from Shibuya to Ueno. How many different ways I can get there? Many, many different ways, right? If there's a disruption, and let's say uh, uh, Akihabara, I can reroute. I can go from the other way. I can go through Ikebukuro. If there's a disruption in Ikebukuro. I can take the Uero line, right? Um, so diversity is very, very essential for having uh, resilience in your system. <laughs> there's different definitions of diversity and redundancy. You can have functional diversity. So again, if I want to go from Shibuya to Ueno, if I want to go, uh, I can go by foot, I can take a bus, I can take a train, I can uh, skateboard, right? So there's different ways, there's different functional diversities. And I'm still, my transport is still very resilient in that aspect. You also have response diversity. So here you see different uh, uh, um, uh, species of the rice plants. Has anyone heard of the Cavendish banana, the common banana we eat today? This is the one of the final remaining species of the banana. Uh, a couple of decades ago, a virus hit uh, other species of the banana and we lost them. So just imagine there's only one remaining banana species. That's not very resilient, right? So we're gonna, we have a response diversity problem. Here. There's another bacterial virus that hits that uh, banana species, we won't have any bananas, right? So same thing with rice. Why we have different uh, species of rice is exactly because of this point. If something happens to one species, the other species can take over, right? So rice will not be destroyed. We will still have uh, food on our tables, right? Um, another element very, very important for resilience is modularity. In modularity, we've all been through the uh, nightmare of COVID days, and you all know what the quarantine system is, right? So quarantine is designed with this uh, modularity in, in, in mind to prevent the cascading of shocks, right? 
And there's a very uh, easy way to uh, measure modularity. Uh, there's mathematical ways to measure modularity uh, through communities. If you look up communities, measuring communities, uh, there's very precise uh, quantifiable formulas for this. This area has not been explored fully and how it uh, relates to a diversity and redundancy. I think it's a research frontier. So if anyone's interested in this stuff, I really encourage you to uh, find the trade-offs between modularity and uh, diversity in systems. It's a very interesting area to be explored further. So I'm not gonna go through the math at all. Uh, this takes a little bit of time, but just to tell you, and going back to the uh, idea of redundancy, Redundancy has a trade-off with efficiency, network efficiency. Network efficiency is the degree of articulation in a system, in a network, right? So how, if, if, if one person is coming out of Shibuya, what is the degree of articulation in the metro system uh, that it can get to Ueno, let's say, right? So how many paths does it have? Does the, the number of paths, are they restricted or are they diverse, right? So that's the opposite end of redundancy and diversity, efficiency, right? That's a tin stuff I was just mentioning to you. If I increase my efficiency, I decrease my redundancy. If I increase my redundancy, I decrease my efficiency, right? It's the opposite end of these two. And I'll put these together in the next slide. It will hopefully make sense to you, yeah? Let's look at some visuals here. Here in the above graph, everything's connected to everything, right? All the nodes, everything's connected to everything. So if I, if I measure this, my efficiency is zero, right? If I come out of uh, compartment number three, there's not a lot of information that I can tell you if someone's coming out of compartment three, where that person's gonna end up at. There's too much available choices, right? So efficiency here is zero. Visually, you can see this as well, right? Redundancy is maximum. The opposite end, you see a network, which is very linear. Your efficiency is very high. Your redundancy is nil. It's zero, right? So if there's a if, if there's a disruption, if there's a disruption between B and E, my system falls apart, right? But what about costs over here? Um, which is more? I mean, obviously, maintaining all those every link in the top figure might be expensive, no? And the bottom figure might be very cheap, but there's no re resiliency in that system, right? So there's ways to measure these things. And it's not only links, but weighted links. So here's another example of weighted links. And you see the numbers change again, but visually it's very easy to look at these uh, networks and get an idea of uh, how much efficiency I have and how much uh, network redundancy I have on these networks. In food webs, this is quite, quite common uh, to look at food webs, who eats who? Right? I go into a forest or I go to a particular swamp or the ocean, and I want to see which animal eats the other animal. Why is this important? Because as a conservation scientist, I want to make sure that system remains, right? despite climate change, despite uh, overfishing by the humans, despite uh, anthropocentric activities. I want to make sure that network uh, continues to the future. Right? So it's nice to map out food webs. Right. So in the bottom example, you see alligators eating large fish, snakes, and turtles. If something happens to turtles, alligators can still eat large fish and snakes. So the network kind of survives, right? But in the top example, if something happens to large fish, alligators are not going to eat prawns. They're just too big for that, right? How are they going to chew prawns or find or hunt prawns? It's not going to happen. So that ecosystem uh, falls apart. That food web is not sustainable. This is why we map these out. And there is a lot of research on food webs. And if you are interested, you can really uh, dig deep on this subject. So let's put these two, let's put it all together in one slide here. What, what does it mean to be uh, resilient in the system, right? Here you see you have two opposite extremes. On one hand, you have a lot of redundancy, which you might think is good, right? Diversity is good. But what, what point diversity is good? Tin stuff, right? What is the trade-off of diversity? Well, diversity is costly. If you have, if everyone's speaking a different language over here, it's perfect, right? There's a lot of diversity, but we need good translation services and that's not cheap, right? If I have a lot of diversity in my system, kind of stagnant, right? My, my ecosystem has to spend a lot of energy making sure everyone's uh, maintained, all this diversity is maintained. 
right? The polar opposite end is greater efficiency, um, which is really good. And we're talking about network efficiency here. We're not talking about economic efficiency. That's a big, big difference. And I've been shouted at many times by economists in various conferences for uh, progressing on their domain. I'm not I'm talking about network efficiency. Um, when your network is too efficient, you're also very brittle, right? Something can go wrong and the network falls apart, right? So ideally, we want a network system which is somewhere in between, right? But where, what is in between is the golden question. A lot of ecologists, they've been uh, examining food webs and um, ecosystem, eco ecological systems. And what they literally do is they catch all these animals, they rip open their stomachs, they count what they had for breakfast and lunch, and they map out these food webs. And about 20 odd uh, food webs that they counted, they found that Mother Nature kind of balances these food networks on the top. Right? That's interesting, I think. Um, so there is some nature, some uh, biomimicry or, or learning from nature when we look at these food webs and ecological uh, system. But it doesn't necessarily mean human systems have to follow that ex exact location, right? I think for uh, human and, uh, and um, economic systems, it's more about the trends. It's more about trends. Is my redundancy going down? Is my efficiency going up? Is my overall resiliency going up or down? This, so the trends are uh, better situated to give us uh, policy insights when we're looking at uh, economic and environmental uh, network systems. But uh, so far, what the ecologists have found that there is some interesting accumulation of uh, these networks on, on the top of this diagram. So there's, there's an interesting balance, right? And again, we're not saying that we should follow this balance, but it's a theoretical uh, point that is of interest to us. All right, so far so good. We talked about the concept and theory. Let's look at some examples. And this is some, some of the research I've been doing so far. Um, um, the first one is water. So we looked at the Heihei River Basin in China, which is a very strategic uh, river basin for agriculture um, in, in China. And this river basin has the upper reaches, is the mountainous areas where the water is accumulated through ice and snow and rain and whatnot. And the middle reaches is where the water is used either for agriculture, for industries, or for landscape. Uh, and the lower reaches is more the uh, ecological endpoints of the river basin where the water is accumulated in the, um, in the tiny, tiny end river um, and lake, I should say, terminal lake. So when you map this out, you can see a network coming to life. And we did this with uh, uh, Akiyama Sensei from, uh, who's, a, who's a hydrologist at Tokyo University. He, we worked together on this. We mapped out the uh, network and uh, you can put numbers in this. And what we noticed, there's a very interesting story behind this, right? So to increase uh, agricultural production, the local government in that region, they uh, developed these water canals. They're, the water canals were dirt, right? So dirt water canals. They poured concrete in these water canals so that more water goes down to the people who are using it for agriculture. But what happened really is that, uh, so water was used more, but water, less water was going to the underground compartments. So when you map it out and you look at it from a network perspective, you see that resiliency is going down, right? There's less and less water is going to the underground compartment, uh, diversity is decreasing and so is resilience. It kind of reaffirmed what people were noticing in that region, but it, it, it gives a new perspective to look at uh, uh, a network water system through uh, these approaches. You can also apply these approaches through trade, right? So we look at trade, uh, we, we looked at uh, global commodity trade networks and we applied, so that, that's an example of cotton trade, HS52. So this is all the countries trading in cotton, right? Um, and when we looked at the 2008, 2009 global shock, we noticed that sectors which had more redundancy in them, they came out of the shock faster and resumed their growth uh, better in a way. 
Sectors that had more efficiency, they came out of the shock slower and they had a difficult time in their recovery. So again, when we applied these uh, metrics to trade, it also reaffirmed uh, what we noticed in other systems and the theoretical and conceptual uh, underpinnings that we use. You can also uh, apply these methods to phosphorus, and phosphorus is something that I am trying to uh, uh, engage more as uh, my visiting professor here at uh, Hiroshima University. Um, so we looked at the network of phosphorus in China for 17th century to the recent years, 2012. Um, and a little bit of background about phosphorus is that phosphorus is a very, very essential element. Has anyone heard of peak phosphorus? Has anyone heard of peak oil? Everyone's heard of peak oil, right? So there's another concept called peak phosphorus in that we won't have enough phosphorus in the near future to feed ourselves. What does that mean? Why, why is phosphorus so important for uh, food security? Well, everything you eat has kind of uh, been grown um, and has been, um, phosphorus has been used to grow that product. Um, for, for plants, phosphorus and nitrogen are essential elements. Nitrogen is something that we have a lot of on this planet, but phosphorus, we don't have a lot. In the sense that phosphorus comes from rocks. So phosphorus rocks, a lot of phosphorus rocks, the biggest uh, uh, country that has phosphorus rocks is Morocco, China as well. But China banned the export of phosphorus. Why is that? Because it's it's super critical for their food security. And it's it's an element that does not is not recycled enough. So you take phosphorus from the mines, you make fertilizer out of it, you grow your plants. You eat the plants or you give the plants to animals, you eat the animals later on, and the phosphorus just ends up as water runoff. The phosphorus goes into the rivers, into the lakes, and we lose it. So there's very little recycling of phosphorus in this world. And the element itself, it's very scarce, right? So that means that we're gonna run out of phosphorus very soon. It's called peak phosphorus, right? Um, so phosphorus, if you map out the natural cycling of phosphorus and the anthropogenic uh, cycling, induced cycling of phosphorus, you get the following network, right? So there's a peak cycling network of China in 2012, and you see the major nodes. Uh, we have environmental nodes from, uh, you have international trade, you have uh, P rocks, phosphorus are from mining. Um, uh, you have the, we also consider stock, aerial, uh, animal husbandry and whatnot, all the different uh, elements of, of phosphorus flows you see here. And what we notice is that, again, phosphorus is, the resilience of phosphorus flows is, is going down uh, by a lot. Since the 17th century, you see a very, uh, uh, you see that the resilience of phosphorus hasn't, it's very stable, right? it hasn't moved so much. 1911, 1950, you see the agricultural revolution, uh, a lot of investments in uh, extracting phosphorus and getting fertilizer and giving it to the farmers, feeding your population, but very, very little recycling, very, very redundancy in this phosphorus networks. And hence you see the resilience of phosphorus going down, right? So in this paper, we use different SSP scenarios, we look at demographic scenarios, um, and we apply different strategies such as food waste, enhancing farm to work efficiency, boosting pre-recycling and whatnot. And through these scenarios, we see that the resilience of phosphorus networks also increases, right? Um, this goes back to the topic of uh, circular economies. Has anyone heard of circular economies, right? So phosphorus research, I think is very, very critical. And it's something that I really encourage you uh, to do more of. Because again, we're having uh, uh, limited amounts of phosphorus and peak phosphorus is a serious, serious thing for food security and society and peace as well. Right? And imagine countries fighting over phosphorus. Um, so this is something of, of uh, critical importance. So we're going to end the discussion on resilience with this last slide. Um, resilience, we argue that it's a public good. At least I like to argue it's a public good. Why is it a public good? If you take any economic classes, you notice that a public good 
is something that is non-excludable and non-rivalrous. I can't exclude anyone from uh, having resilience. And if everyone has resilience, then it's, you know, it's nothing to be uh, fighting over. It's, it's non-rivalrous, right? What else is a public good? Does anyone know what else is a public good here? Education is a public good, right? Healthcare is a public good. Uh, security, national security is a public good, right? So everyone has it, everyone has it. No one's gonna fight over it and it benefits everyone. So if we have resilience in our networks, um, we can view this as a public good. And again, with a public good, everyone needs to chip in. It's, it's a, it requires joint efforts and joint resources for its implementation. So if I want resilience in a particular economic sector, all the companies and the nations have to work for this, right? But the benefit of public goods in general is that they have network externalities or positive externalities, right? And the positive externality of uh, resilience would be peace and sustainability. So this is something to, um, I think when you especially see, uh, let's say a company that is saying, okay, why do I need to invest additional amounts of resources for my resilience? So this is the reason, right? So even though it costs a little bit to have redundancy in your networks, um, it, it gives you benefits. It gives you positive externalities if you do it right. And if you do it collaboratively at a sectoral and international scale. Okay. So let's talk about the other concept, which I have an abstract, which is uh, dependency risk. And here we're going to apply the concept of pointwise mutual information. Has anyone uh, considered the risks of having dependency to trading partners? It's all over the news these days, right? The uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict had serious uh, implications for food security, right? Before, the, uh, before this war, I had no idea that uh, both of these uh, countries have such an essential role, uh, not only on uh, staple foods, but also fertilizers. I had no idea. And both countries export a lot of food, staple foods, especially soybeans, wheat, uh, to a limited amount of corn as well, not so much rice, um, and a lot of uh, fertilizers as well. And the problem with dependency is that you might look at the trade book and you say, okay, I'm importing X amount directly from country A. But trade networks don't really work like that. Trade networks have indirect effects, right? So Russia and Ukraine export their products to Europe, and then Europe exports their products to, let's say, the global south, Africa, for example, right? Or other countries in Asia. If I am sitting in uh, a country in Asia and I want to measure my dependency to uh, Ukraine or Russia, I don't see any dependency. I'm not, I'm not importing from that, right? I'm importing from a third country, I'm importing from Europe. So how do I capture these dependencies? And how do I capture the risk of dependency, trade dependency from a network perspective? This is where point-wise mutual information can come into uh, play. So PMI is one of the... Uh, Submetrics of ecological information based approach. It also has a cousin in linguistics. Has anyone heard of uh, collocations? Any linguists here? No? Collocations is uh, uh, it's quite common research in the field of uh, language. And the idea is that you have a corpus of language, you have a dictionary, right? You have a lingu linguistic corpus, right? So how are these words connected to each other? What do I say strong with? I don't say powerful. Has anyone heard of powerful wind? It makes sense, right? But we don't use it in English, right? So we tend to say strong wind. So the word strong has a high collocation, has a high point-wise mutual information with the second word wind, right? Um, so same thing we can apply to trade. If $1 value uh, of fertilizer is coming out of Ukraine, what's the probability of it reaching, let's say, uh, Japan, right? If you look at the direct import and export, it's zero, right? But from a uh, network perspective, there is some value in this connection. 
So using pointwise mutual information, uh, you can better capture these indirect effects. And this is something that uh, we want to accomplish. This is something I'm trying to do with phosphorus um, and, uh, and food uh, here at Hiroshima for, for, for the research day uh, until next year, right? <laughs> so, um, and why is this related to peace? So how is trade dependency related to peace? Well, if you manage your trade dependency, uh, you are also eliminating either research competition, which is good for peace, right? Or you're eliminating, you're increasing economic interdependence. If I have the right peaceful partners on food and fertilizer, it will help me to maintain the peace. If I have a partner which wants to use uh, the product as a weapon, then I'm definitely not going to have peace, right? So managing your partners, managing your dependency, managing the risk of your dependency is very essential for maintaining long-term peace in this way. Um, you can use scenarios here. So you can use scenarios of war, trade conflict, demographic uh, growth, urbanization, affluence, and whatnot to establish uh, um, uh, the risk of dependency for the critical uh, food products, staple food products, and also fertilizers. For fertilizers, if you look at UN Comtrade or any other trade databases, they don't have a section called fertilizer. You have to look at uh, urea, DAP, potash. These are the commonly traded uh, fertilizer elements. But most of them, again, they contain phosphorus in them, or nitrogen for that matter. So again, we're looking at phosphorus here, really, uh, as, as a proxy through the fertilizer uh, data set. The second part of the uh, research that I want to get involved with, and here I need your help actually, because you're living here in Hiroshima and you can uh, have better insights on this, is how can cities uh, better engage in decreasing the uh, risk of dependency for imports of uh, fertilizer, import of phosphorus, has anyone heard of this? Uh, it's, it's a quite common uh, quoted uh, uh, statement that the battle of sustainable development is won or lost in cities. Same thing with uh, fertilizers as well. <laughs> cities have a lot of uh, power, a lot of uh, uh, potential in engaging in circular economies and uh, recycling phosphorus, and recycling fertilizer. Unfortunately, we don't do that. And um, to a certain extent, it's uh, a lot of individual food waste uh, leads to the uh, loss of phosphorus and loss of fertilizer. So how can we have more recycling of fertilizer for food waste in a city such as uh, Hiroshima? What are the economic, social, and technological barriers? Right? And what are common strategies for engaging communities and stakeholders? What can we learn from Hiroshima and apply it in other cities and other countries? for recycling uh, for uh, food and recycling and, and re-engaging, you know, having circular economies for, for phosphorus and fertilizer. I recently visited uh, uh, Southeast Asia and particularly uh, Thailand and, uh, uh, and China. What I saw was really amazing in the sense that they had these little tuk-tuk trucks and they go around these uh, restaurant areas and they will collect uh, food waste from the restaurants. And upon questioning them, I, I learned that this is, uh, in fact, for recycling, uh, for getting fertilized out of food waste, uh, food waste. In Europe, some countries, uh, individuals recycle their food waste and they give it to the local governments to make phosphorus, to make fertilizer and phosphorus out of it again. But in Japan, despite its uh, very, very strict recycling laws, we don't see food waste being recycled at an individual level, at least not all prefectures. So I think it could be a very interesting uh, research project to see what are the barriers out there and how can we uh, engage the stakeholders and what lessons we can learn for other cities and other communities. Uh, do, we, do we have like two minutes? Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I also put some two slides about our YSSB program in IASA, which I hope uh, if you're a PhD student, please do apply. Um, YASA is a summer program. It runs from June to August. Uh, it's in Luxembourg. It's at an ancient castle, uh, which Princess Sisi and uh, the Habsburg Emperor used to stay at. 
Uh, it's open to PhD scholars whose research corresponds to uh, Yasa's programs. And the goal is to help you uh, publish. Uh, it's usually at the final second or third year of your PhD. And there is funding available based on uh, the uh, national member organization which you will be representing. Uh, so YAS is a great opportunity. There's usually 50 uh, students from around the world, and you make uh, very long-term, uh, solid connections. To, the, to this day, I'm still publishing with my uh, uh, cohorts from that uh, 2012 program, <laughs> and it's a very uh, fun, interactive, and uh, enriching uh, choice for your career. Uh, the deadline's coming up in uh, 12th of January. If you are interested, please do get in touch, and I can help you with the application there. So thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. I come from Luxembourg. It's a very beautiful place in summer. <laughs> so please do apply. So I, I think now we have uh, enough time for questions and comments. So first, I'd like to know if there are any questions from the audience here. Yes. Okay. So, uh, thanks very much for the great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, and just on 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 that last uh, you know on that last point of yours on the recycling. So, I, in if you haven't been in in Higashi Hiroshima, we have a very modern and great uh, recycling facility. I've actually been there, and you can visit it where, where they take where they collect a lot of our garbage, and it's they have a scientific way of separating out different types of it, and then some of it is recycled for for fertilizer. It's not done at an individual households so don't actually separate out the, the food waste. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, but I've seen that happen in other countries, but, but they, they have some methodology. So it's quite an amazing facility. Actually, as part of a NERPS, uh, as, part of, as part of one of the NERPS programs, uh, some students were actually taken there. So quite interesting. But th thanks very much on, on the redundancy and efficiency and also your tin FAFL acronym. That, 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 that was quite interesting. Uh, yeah, I've worked for, for, for many years in, in, in the private sector, including during the financial crisis 2008. I saw what happened during COVID as well. So it's just a, you know, it's, it's just a comment rather than anything else that I, I think for sure there is, there is a lot of focus, maybe more in the private sector on efficiency. And then, they, and, then we, and then they sacrifice a little bit in terms of redundancy. And it doesn't hit on a day-to-day -day basis. But when there's a specific crisis, then then everything breaks down, and I think that was yeah. the point of one of, one of, one of the graphs as well. Uh, uh, maybe one question related to this point in terms of food security. Uh, in in my own mind, I think there's a lot of focus today on 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 making production happen in in only certain places, for example, wheat or, or uh, you know other fruits, etc. But, but uh, do you not think it's better to have uh, the production kind of spread out? So you have everyone being, every country or region or even city being more self-sufficient in, in producing something like food or water, which is very, very important, rather than trying to get some temporary efficiency gain. But then you, 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 if, if, you if you focus production in, in one or two areas. Uh, but then if you do that, you know, it, it has, I think the way the world's food chains have moved, it's all towards, uh, it, it, you, you can produce stuff only in certain areas. One thing is produced in one area. And Japan, I was very surprised to find out, uh, I think is only 30 to 40% actually food, uh, food uh, self-sufficient. It imports a huge amount of food. So yeah, that's basically my question, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. The companies, uh, they are realizing more and more the importance of redundancy. I think Apple, uh, there was a few uh, years back, the story of Apple losing a key component of its production chain in Thailand due to the floods. And after that incident, they realized that they need to distribute a little bit and spend, uh, not be so efficient in a network sense so that uh, they're better prepared for uh, potential risk you know, that, that come across here. Yeah. And thank you for the uh, uh, suggestion to visit the uh, recycling center. That's definitely on my plan. Yeah, I, I really want to uh, visit and learn more about the, uh, the recycling methods here. Yeah. Um, the the final point you had, uh, can you remind me? Self sufficiency. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is possible? So, yeah, food's a fascinating subject, uh, to be honest. Uh, unfortunately, there's too much subsidies in food. Um, so what we see in the international food market today is very uh, disrupted by the governments. It's not uh, a free market. 
Um, and that prevents, um, has a lot of negative consequences in that sense, has a lot of uh, negative consequences in terms of uh, emissions and uh, imbalanced trade. There was a study that if there was no food subsidies and agricultural subsidies in the world, the world's food basket would be in Africa. Not only that would help uh, uh, the economic situation of that continent, but also we have cheaper food and more plenty of food in the world. Um, so there is serious discussions to be had on, on food in general. And in, in the olden days, uh, you're absolutely right. It was more, it was more modular. Uh, everyone used to uh, basically not only recycle their fertilizers more, but also grow their own food, become have, have more uh, dependency. Uh, independent to be more independent uh, from each other in terms of food production, but that also has its own trade-offs as well. But uh, yeah, in my opinion, uh, I completely agree with you. We we need to reimagine uh, the future of uh, food systems because it's not, uh, especially this uh, the long fork to mile of uh, farm to uh, farm to fork mileage. I think it's a very uh, a bad situation in terms of uh, uh, emissions and staff for climate change. So the, in Japan, we have this concept of chisan chisho, which is local production for local consumption. I think this is something that uh, needs to be researched more and implemented more uh, for future societies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Prince. Let's see. Please introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Prince Dakosta Bwari, uh, a PhD student at the Hidek Institute, Hiroshima University. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, well, my, my is more of maybe a suggestion or something that uh, researchers can look into uh, going forward. So I, I was looking at resilience as, as, a moral, uh, as a public good, and I was just asking myself if if we say resilience is a public good, and we all know that uh, when it comes to public goods, uh, there is a concept of moral suasion where people feel like if uh, this is a public good and uh, it's non non rivalry, non excludable, more or less like, uh, for instance, if Rohan San is using a road, it does not stop me from using the road, and uh, the fact that I'm using the road means or does not mean one son cannot use the road. So I'm I'm looking at what role will moral solution play in achieving resilience where we we try to use other concepts or other strategies to persuade people uh, to achieve resilience. Because if we are saying resilience is a public good, then it, people might abuse the use of it or, or might not actually want to achieve it because most of the times public goods are supplied by the government. So how, what role will, will the concept of moral suasion, where we use concept, other concepts, other strategies to try to achieve resilience, if actually resilience is a public good. Mm -hmm. So that's more like a, a question or something that we can look into. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I don't have the perfect answer for it, but um... Yeah, and, and it resonates well, your question resonates well with the, uh, the concept of the tragedy of the commons. Yes. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there is no simple fix to this, um, unfortunately. But I think through raising awareness, education, and convincing people uh, in the long term, that's the only way to uh, avoid uh, uh, such uh, the tragedy of the commons and, and moral hazards as you uh, just mentioned. Yeah. But uh, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't have a perfect uh, uh, answer to it. Um, I think you need to get into a little bit of a social design, uh, public psychology, and those issues as well. Uh, it's quite often if you uh, survey people, people might say that, yes, I will pay for uh, sustainable goods, but in reality, they never do. So there's a big disconnect on what people say and what people do. Behavioral economics actually is a very good field uh, uh, to you know, dig in deeper into this uh, topic as well. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, please introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah, and sorry, just a moment. So for the online participants, if you have any comments or questions, 
please feel free to use the Q&A box. I don't know if they're here. Yeah, thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Thank you for the talk. I'm Anna. I'm uh, on an exchange here. Actually, I grew up very close to Luxembourg in, in Austria. <laughs> and I know some people who work there or still work there right now. Malzeit. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Martin. Um, I have two comments. Uh, the first one was uh, you said that imagine a future where people fight about phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remembered that some weeks ago we had a NERPS talk where a young woman from Western Sahara, she was here and uh, informed us about the conflict there. And she said that uh, she also mentioned phosphorus. And now I quickly Googled and actually some parts of this conflict there seem to be related to phosphorus already. So yes. um, Morocco kind of steals or yeah brings phosphorus from uh, conflict areas there and, and sells them mm. um, for a lot of money. Yeah, that was the first comment I, I wanted to make. So we, we seem to be in times where all these things already happen. Mm. It's not something that's coming in the future anymore. And the second one was about the food systems. Um, because I recently heard about uh, an interesting concept to think about emissions in food systems, and um, especially when it comes from um, farm to fork, when it comes to farm to fork. And it's um, like Daniel Ricardo's comparative advantages, but um, used for emissions. So um, that you have a look at uh, um, how the emissions can be reduced best because in our lab, a girl um, had a look at uh, producing food in Spain and then transporting it to the Netherlands versus um, producing them in the Netherlands, but with heated uh, greenhouses. And she found that actually in some cases, it's better to produce them in Spain and then transport it. Mm. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to share. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, um, yeah, definitely. You see there's conflict in Western Sahara, uh, and I'm not taking sides who is, uh, has the ownership of uh, the phosphorus uh, mines over there. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, by having circular economies for phosphorus in, uh, uh, in advanced economies such as Japan, we can definitely contribute to the uh, peaceful resolution of, of uh, the conflict over there. So you see if uh, countries that import a lot of uh, fertilizer and not even direct fertilizer, we can look at embodied fertilizer as well. So every apple you import from, uh, let's say, uh, well, apples are well produced here, but every product you import to Japan has certain um, phosphorus embedded in it. So the same thing as virtual water, we can talk about virtual phosphorus. By engaging in more local production and having more circular economies, you can, you can contribute to the peace of uh, the regions such as Western Sahara and Morocco. Uh, yeah, food to uh, farm to fork mileage, and uh, especially when it comes to emissions, is a very complicated subject. I've seen some studies that show that farmers in Argentina, beef, beef farmers in Argentina and Brazil, uh, for them, think it's uh, it might make sense to engage in very heavy uh, uh, animal husbandry. But once you transport these uh, this meat, you know the, the mileage attached to this transportation gives you a different outcome in terms of emissions. Yeah. So it really depends on the case. I think it's it's uh, it's not appropriate for us to make general uh, assumptions that okay, uh, food trade is bad. It's bad for emissions and. We really have to be um, careful with uh, what exactly the numbers are behind it. And there are researchers working on the subject where you pick up a product, let's say coffee. Coffee, now every product has a nutritional label behind it. So the idea is I have a label which tells me how much uh, water, how much uh, phosphorus, and how much uh, emissions have gone into this product. And as a consumer, I have the power to choose and I have a power to contribute to uh, uh, the future that I want to see. So thank you for that comment there. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience here? Yeah, I know you, there, there is an online question. So we've got a question from online participants. 
This is from uh, Dr. Leila Mohammed. She says that in ecological network analysis, could we also consider about cost of redundancy versus efficiency to find optimal balance since increasing redundancy also needs more budget? Yeah, there's uh, uh, the formula and the, the concept behind it definitely allow you to do this. Uh, you need to figure out uh, the, the costs of it, basically. You need to figure out, I think you can achieve this with scenario analysis. So you can put a scenario where you increase redundancy and see how much it costs, and then uh, compare it to another scenario. You can also use uh, MCDA analysis to choose between the uh, scenarios best suited for your um, uh, so the question at hand. Um, so it's definitely possible, yes, uh, depending on the data and the uh, data sources you have. Usually in these situations, lack of data is what really prohibits you from carrying out a cost uh, benefit analysis. So. Thank you. We have uh, time for a few more questions. Any other questions from the audience here? Online participants, please feel free to share your comments, questions. Yeah, so I, I really liked uh, the kind of efficiency and redundancy question, and I, I thought about uh, I, I thought about that a lot in, in my own life, uh, in, in my uh, you know in my working life as well. And I think one of the challenges, and you 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 briefly refer to that right now, is it's it's very easy to measure efficiency. Like it's it's very you, you can see your profit or you can see the amount of sales you've made. But then redundancy, I think, is much more difficult to quantify, and it becomes very complicated. And you you have to build in a, a model assumptions and things. So. And again, from my own observation experiences, these redundancies are not required every day, but you, you need them once in 10 years or once in five years or sometimes once in a hundred years. So then it becomes very difficult with that. And, and hence, I think there is a lot of focus on the efficiency side. Uh, and then people forget about redundancy until something really big happens, like for example, COVID or exactly, you know, the financial crisis and everything else. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the thing with when you look at the natural world, the natural world is uh, is very unforgiving, in the sense that uh, it's it's a uh, everyone eats everyone basically, right? So in, in the natural world world, uh, Mother Nature forces the system to uh, find the right balance in a way. But uh, in the human world, we we can't be uh, as unforgiving with each other, especially right. So it takes time to find the right balance and it takes time to uh, convince people or uh, to, to the need for redundancy or, uh, or, or value the level of redundancy as you so kindly pointed out there. So this is uh, something that takes time in a way. And I think companies are taking note. They're, they're noticing that in every time a disaster hits because they lack redundancy in their networks, uh, their profit margin uh, was hurt. So gradually they're, they're learning, but then what is the optimal level? What is the best level? Should I put additional redundancy in my network? Should I take off redundancy? That's something that we don't have a clear answer for, unfortunately. Uh, and it, and it's, it's a more uh, learning by experience uh, situation. I think, in my opinion. Uh, the math might give you a number, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will experience the same exact sort of shock again and again, right? So you, you might be surprised again. But, uh, uh, so this kind of goes into the uh, field of risk analysis and systemic risk, which is a whole different uh, ballgame on its own, yeah. But uh, you're absolutely right with that. Another question from Emmanuel Corey. He's a student from the International Peace and Coexistence Program. His question is, how do we manage the nexus between ecological resilience and extractive resource industries, mainly in developing countries, in order to maintain ecological balance? Um, challenging question. Challenging question. <laughs> um, yeah, again, uh, I think circular economies would be the, the best answer for that. Um, circular economies not only um, helps you extract less from nature, uh, but it also um, helps you not get involved with these uh, 
conflict zones in a way. So by extracting less from nature, you have less impact on nature. That helps ecological uh, sustainability in many ways. Uh, so achieving, I mean, circular economies now is a hot topic. So a lot of people talk about it. So I think it's a very interesting uh, field. Uh, I think that technology is out there. It's more about engaging the stakeholders and implementing it, uh, making sure people are engaged in circular economies, which is uh, more challenging. So the social side is, is the more challenging part. The technological side and, and the financial side, it, it's well established, I think. Um, but finding the right the right people, the right elements, and making the right connections between industries and companies is what uh, is, is still challenging and is, is still remaining. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions? Nadia. Thank you, Dr. Ali Dani Tamawa, from your um, not a question, but more of a reflection, especially from the peace, uh, peace uh, and security uh, perspective. Um, I, I'm just so frustrated that I wish, like in practice, we can see uh, or we can push a mindset toward resilience rather than zero sum, you know, game. But that's what's happening on the ground, especially in conflict context. Um, Rebel groups, for example, will capture certain um, natural resources or will block certain access to roads for the benefit, for their benefit, right? Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how we can, you don't have to answer this, but I'm just wondering for all of us, how, how we can um, better integrate the thinking of resilience, especially for um, actors who actually benefit from the heart, because they see this, um, 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 capturing certain resources will be beneficial for them. They don't see the holistic benefits that, for example, um, ecological resilience will, so will bring to them. Just like on the policy side, I, I, I'm just hoping how we can really emphasize this. Um, not just, of course, it will, it will be very difficult to perhaps have a conversation with the uh, um, active conflict actors, but at least from the governance side, how we can, you know, um, encourage them to think this way, this shift in mindset rather than this zero sum mm. thinking. But not a question, but I'd love to hear your reaction or your comments to that. Thank you. Um, this this kind of goes back to systems thinking. Uh, humans are uh, very limited in their rationality. And Herbert Simon famously said that we're bounded in our rationality. He won a Nobel Prize for it, in fact. Um, so we, we naturally inclined to think very linearly and be very myopic. So as you mentioned, the rebel groups or, or governments for that matter, uh, when they block uh, roads or capture resources for their own benefit, this is very uh, naturally uh, human thing to do because they're very myopic in their thinking. How do we counter that? Well, through uh, systems thinking. And one way is to bring if they agree to come into one room together and sit down and map out the, uh, the situation through systems thinking, through causal loop diagrams, you can see where uh, these, um, uh, these feedback loops and these problems are, are arising. And people begin to see that, okay, in the long term, it's better for me to cooperate on this issue or not block this road or not take all this resource for myself. But yeah, seeing the state of the world, this is what this is the natural thing for humans to do, unfortunately, because we're very bounded in our rationality, and very, very myopic in, in seeing the future. Yeah. But through education and raising awareness again. Um, so the next special lecture we're going to have, we're going to do some causal diagrams. We'll, we'll see what I mean in practice. Uh, but again, people have to have the willingness and stomach to, even though they hate each other, to sit down and talk to each other and and map out the conflict. If they don't have that, then the science can't really help them at all. Um, so that's that's uh, that's my that's my reaction to it at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I know uh, there's a lot of interest in the topic, but in the interest of time, I think we need to close the session now. So once again, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Karazi for taking the time. Please give him a big applause. Thank you. Before closing, I just want to make two announcements. Uh, we, we just finished with this issue of causal loops and system thinking. This Thursday from 10.30, there will be uh, another workshop 
that uh, Ali kindly agreed to uh, hold on system thinking and causal loops. It will be in Mirai Kriya, right? Second floor. Yeah, so please, please join that uh, workshop. And also, uh, we will have uh, the next NERVS conference from March 6 to March 9. Please also uh, consider attending that conference. And also, uh, please uh, visit our website at nerves.org and uh, get subscribed to our newsletter. You will find out about more exciting activities that we do. So with that, uh, once again, I would like to thank all of you and thank our speaker for uh, this exciting uh, talk. And we look forward to see you again in near future. Thank you.